I'm Professor Darius. Welcome to African Elements, where we explore the depth and diversity of Black history, culture, and social justice issues. In this video, we explore how African American labor has been stolen throughout U.S. history, the rise of African American labor unions, and the fight for economic justice. If you'd like to support this channel, please consider joining the History Makers on Patreon, sending a super thanks, or subscribing to our channel. With that out of the way, let's jump in. The history of African American labor is a story of exploitation, oppression, and theft. For centuries, black workers in America have been subjected to economic injustice, denied the right to unionize, and paid wages far below those of their white counterparts. The theft of black labor began with the institution of slavery. From the 17th to the mid-19th century, millions of Africans were forcibly brought to the Americas and forced into chattel slavery. White enslavers stole the labor of these enslaved Africans and used their labor to build the American economy. By the mid-19th century, cotton alone accounted for more than half of all U.S. exports. Enslaved Africans were the primary labor force responsible for producing this cotton, which helped make the United States a significant player in the global economy. The value of enslaved Africans in the United States was estimated to be worth around $3.5 billion in 1860. That number was more than the value of all factories, railroads, and other capital investments in the United States at the time. The slave trade was lucrative for the northern merchants as well, and for the banks. For example, Rhode Island was one of the leading centers of the United States slave trade, with ships leaving from its ports carrying enslaved Africans to the south. Rhode Island was responsible for an estimated 60 to 90 percent of all U.S. slave trading voyages. The use of enslaved African laborers extended to industries other than agriculture. For example, many enslaved Africans were forced to work in mines producing coal, iron, and other minerals essential to the U.S. economy. The economic disparities between white and black Americans today are visible in the legacy of slavery. For example, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, in 2021, the median weekly earnings for black workers were only 75.3% of those for white workers. The racialized nature of many industries and occupations is also traceable to slavery. For example, domestic service and agricultural work traditionally performed by enslaved Africans continues to be some of the lowest paying and most racially segregated industries in the U.S. today. Those industries include sharecropping and the cycle of debt and poverty. Many African Americans became sharecroppers after the Civil War, working as tenant farmers on land owned by white landlords. Sharecroppers were often trapped in cycles of debt and poverty as they gave a portion of their crops to the landlord in exchange for the use of land and supplies. This system allowed white landowners to exploit the labor of African American workers without paying them fair wages. Vagrancy laws, black codes, and convict leasing. After the Civil War, many southern states passed laws that criminalized unemployment and loitering. Those laws were often enforced disproportionately against African Americans who were more likely to be unemployed or unable to pay fines. The result was a system of forced labor known as convict leasing, in which African Americans were imprisoned and forced to work on plantations or in mines without pay. Even in industries where African Americans found employment, they were often paid less than their white counterparts for doing the same work. This racial wage gap persisted well into the 20th century and contributed to the ongoing economic inequality between white and black workers. African American women were often relegated to jobs as domestic workers, such as maids and cooks. These jobs were poorly paid and lacked basic labor protections, such as overtime pay and workplace safety regulations. African American sanitation workers, who were responsible for collecting garbage in many cities, were often subjected to dangerous working conditions and were paid less than white workers in similar jobs. The discrimination African American sanitation workers faced was just one example of the larger issue of racism and segregation in the U.S. labor movement. In the early years, many labor unions actively excluded or marginalized African American workers, perpetuating a system that prioritized the concerns and needs of white male workers over those of other groups. This legacy of discrimination has had a lasting impact 
on the U.S. economy and society and continues to shape the struggle for economic justice and the right to unionize today. This discrimination was not limited to labor movement itself. Many industries were racially segregated, with African-American workers confined to specific jobs and denied access to better-paying, more skilled positions. The federal government also played a role in perpetuating segregation with policies such as vagrancy laws and black codes that criminalized unemployment, disproportionately affecting African Americans. The racial segregation and discrimination that permeated many industries and policies in the early years of the labor movement made it difficult for African American workers to organize and advocate for their rights. However, despite these challenges, the Colored National Labor Union, or CNLU, emerged as the first union of African American workers in 1869. The CNLU fought tirelessly for better working conditions and wages for black workers, challenging the discriminatory practices common in the workplace. Although the CNLU was short-lived, its legacy inspired future labor unions to continue the fight for economic justice and the right to unionize for African American workers. One of the most famous African American unions was the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, founded in 1925 by A. Philip Randolph. The union represented the African American Pullman porters, subjected to low wages and poor working conditions. The Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters fought for better pay, working conditions, and union recognition. Their victory in 1937 marked the first time a major corporation recognized a labor union of African American workers. By necessity, African Americans took on most of the heavy lifting in the fight against the theft of black labor through a convergence of the civil rights movement and the black labor movement. They did so because the federal government has proven itself reluctant to act on behalf of black people, absent pressure from black movements. Even during the Civil War, African American soldiers were paid less than their white counterparts, even when performing the same duties. This wage discrimination resulted from systemic racism and a belief among some white officers that African American soldiers were not as skilled or reliable as white soldiers. Despite these challenges, African American soldiers played a crucial role in the Union's victory in the Civil War. During World War II, the defense industries heavily recruited African Americans to work in such areas as shipbuilding and manufacturing. However, they were often relegated to low-paying menial jobs and denied opportunities for advancement. In the 1940s, A. Philip Randolph led the March on Washington movement to protest racial discrimination in the defense industry and to demand better job opportunities for African Americans. Randolph, the head of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, organized the march to pressure President Franklin D. Roosevelt to issue an executive order banning discrimination in the defense industry. Randolph initially planned the march for July 1, 1941. However, he postponed it after Roosevelt issued Executive Order 8802, which banned discrimination in defense industries and established the Fair Employment Practices Committee, or FEPC, to monitor compliance. However, Randolph continued to press for more vigorous action, arguing that the FBPC was not doing enough to enforce the order and that discrimination persisted in many industries outside defense. The March on Washington movement gained momentum throughout 1942, as Randolph and other leaders organized rallies and demonstrations across the country. On June 25, 1942, Randolph met with Roosevelt to demand stronger action on civil rights issues, including the passage of anti-lynching legislation and the desegregation of the armed forces. Although the march never took place, the March on Washington movement was a pivotal moment in the history of civil rights, and it helped raise awareness about the need for stronger action to combat racial discrimination, laying the groundwork for later civil rights campaigns. The legacy of the March on Washington movement is still visible in the many protests and demonstrations that have taken place throughout U.S. history to demand justice and equality for African Americans and other groups. For example, in the late 1960s and early 1970s, African American workers began to unionize against employment discrimination. The Dodge Revolutionary Union Movement, or DRUM, founded in 1968, was a radical labor union that fought for the rights of African American auto workers in Detroit. DRUM challenged the racism of the United Auto Workers and fought for better wages, working conditions, and job security for African-American workers. 
The theft of black labor has been a defining feature of U.S. history. From the horrors of slavery and the racism and segregation that permeated the early labor movement, African American workers have faced economic injustice and discrimination. However, the rise of African American labor unions and the fight for workers' rights has brought about significant change. I'm Professor Darius. More than ever, I want to extend my deepest gratitude to the history makers over on Patreon for their continued support. For reasons, quite frankly, I don't understand. YouTube has demonetized this channel. I'm currently appealing, but at the moment, the only way to donate to this channel is through Patreon. Please, if you're not in a position to support the channel through a cash contribution, hold on to your money. But if you can spare just a dollar a month, I would be greatly honored, and you can gain early access to ad-free content. Otherwise, you can support African Elements for free just by dropping a like, commenting, subscribing, and sharing. Either way, thank you for watching, and until next time, I'll see you in the comments.